In today's experiment, we're going to be looking at the use of polarimetry. Now, polarimetry is the use of plain polarized light and passing that light through a solution that contains a chiral molecule and looking at the rotation of that plain polarized light. Now, this is actually why chiral molecules are referred to as optically active molecules, because it's only chiral molecules that will rotate plain polarized light. A chiral molecules do not rotate plain polarized light. Now, in the first part of this experiment, we're going to use polarimetry and that rotation of light to identify a white solid as one of these four sugar molecules. Now, each of these sugars, so I have, I have an unknown compound, an unknown white solid, and I want to identify it as one of these four sugars, so maltose, glucose, sucrose, or fructose. And you notice that each of them has a very different uh, rotation value here in degrees. Now, it's given the term alpha in brackets, and we'll talk about this in just a moment. But maltose has a specific rotation of 130.5 degrees. Uh, 130.5 degrees. Um, glucose is about 53. Sucrose is about 66 and a half, and fructose is negative 92. Now you might be a little bit confused by this alpha in brackets with a superscript and a subscript. What's going on there? Well, it turns out that the amount of rotation of that plain polarized light by a solution of an optically active molecule depends very much on the concentration of that solution. If we have more optically active molecules, you're going to get more rotation of that plain polarized light. And it's also dependent on the path length. So how long the light is traveling through the solution. A longer path length means we're going to have a larger rotation value than a shorter path length of the same concentration. Finally, temperature can also affect uh, the amount of rotation to some degree. And it's also important to note the wavelength of light that we are using for that plain polarized light. And so we define something known as the specific rotation, which is alpha in brackets. And in superscript, we put the temperature that the measurement is recorded at. And in subscript, we place the wavelength of light that is used. Now, D isn't a wavelength, but D refers to deuterium. And the deuterium line spectrum has a line at 589 nanometers, which is most commonly used for these measurements. And so if you see D here, it means we're using a wavelength of 589 nanometers. Now, how, how do we record this and, and what do we even use it for? Well, as I just mentioned, because the amount of rotation varies with concentration and path length, then uh, two separate scientists in two separate labs measuring the same identical molecule, let's say glucose, could come out with completely different rotations if they simply use different concentrations or different length uh, polarimetry cells. And so we want to have a uniform value that can be consistent regardless of the concentration, regardless of the path length. And so that's what the specific rotation is defined as. And so it's given this form here. So there's a factor of 10 uh, first, because in olden times, concentration was reported in grams per deciliter, which is less common than grams per milliliter or grams per cubic centimeter today. And so there's a factor of 10 here for that slight difference. Then we have alpha obs or alpha observed. This is the actual value of rotation that you measure in lab. Whatever it happens to be, this is the amount of degrees that the plane polarized light moves between the, uh, when it first enters the light or the solution and when it exits. And then in the denominator here, we have two factors. We have C and L. Well, C is the concentration and that is given in grams per milliliter or grams per cubic centimeter. It's the same thing. And then L is reported in centimeters. This is the path length of the polarimetry cell. And so if we use different concentrations, if we use different path lengths, but we're going to come out with different observed rotation values. But if we plug all those numbers into this equation, we will always come out with a consistent specific rotation for that molecule. 
And so the first part of this experiment is we're going to measure the observed rotation for our unknown solution. We're going to take the unknown sugar, make up a solution of this, and then measure the optical rotation using, polarimeter, using the polarimeter. And then we will convert that observed rotation to a specific rotation and use that value to identify which of these four sugars it is. Okay, so here we are in the lab. We're going to take stereochemistry unknown number one. You see right here, it's a white solid indistinguishable from any of the known sugars. And we're gonna measure out about three grams of this into a small beaker shown here. And then we're going to add 30 milliliters of distilled water to this and make up a homogeneous solution, which we can then use in the polarimeter. Now, we don't need to obsess over getting exactly 3.000 grams of the unknown. We simply need to pay attention to exactly how much we do get so that we can then calculate the concentration. So pay careful attention as I measure out uh, approximately three grams of this unknown. Okay, so here we are at the balance. Normally when you go to measure something out, you use a piece of weigh paper here. And often a mistake that people will make is to simply place the weigh paper flat onto the balance. And it makes it difficult to remove the weigh paper from the balance. So here we'll place the weigh paper onto the balance. It's then rather difficult to get the weigh paper off of the balance. And it's sometimes a little tricky to pour your material into whatever container you want. So what I tend to do is I tend to take this piece of weigh paper and Fold it diagonally, make a center crease, and then sort of open it back up again. This allows it to sit somewhat upright on the scale, making it easily uh, removable. And then also after I've weighed out my material, then I simply have to fold it like this and I can pour into whatever container I need. Now, in this particular instance, since we're weighing out quite a large amount, three grams is quite a, a large volume of material, of solid material, what I will actually do instead is simply weigh it directly into the beaker itself. So I'll place the beaker on the scale, make sure the windows are closed. You hear that, uh, that small beep from the instrument saying that it's ready, and then I have to zero or tear that. And then now I'm set to weigh out my material. So. I'll open one of the windows here, open the other one as well, take the unknown, and then begin to scoop into it. Now you'll notice it's in milligrams, so rather than looking for three, I'm looking for 3,000 to get me approximately three grams. And before I get my final mass, there's a couple things to note. I spilled just a very small amount of material onto the scale here along the side. So I'm going to use the brush to remove that carefully. And then finally, I want to close the windows so that any air currents don't adjust the final mass measurement. So I'll set that there. And then now we can record our final mass here of 3.018 grams or 3,018 milligrams. Oh, looks like it's changed a little bit. We have to wait for it to fully settle. And we can take this value here now that it's no longer changing as our final mass. 
Next, we come over to the distilled water spigot and take and measure 30 milliliters of distilled water. We can now take our 30 milliliters of water and mix it into the three grams of unknown and create our homogeneous solution. We want to continue to mix until the solution is fully homogeneous and all these little chunks of material have fully dissolved. This is now sufficiently homogeneous to take to the polarimetry cell. So here we are in front of the polarimeter, and we have two different polarimetry cells that we could use in this experiment. We have a 20 centimeter long cell, and you'll notice that it has this particular bulge around the glass at this point. This is in case we happen to have an air bubble in our solution, that that air bubble can sit in this little bulge and not be in the path length uh, of the light that's passing through. However, sometimes it's, it's more convenient just to work with smaller volumes. And so we have a 10 centimeter path length cell shown here. And what I was just doing was screwing on one of these uh, windows. So if you look carefully here at the end, there is a, a window there and there's same on the other side and same on the 20 centimeter cell. These can be removed this is how we would fill the cell with our solution. Now, I've brought along our solution. It's right here. When you go to fill a polarimetry cell, you want to be very careful because, as we just mentioned, we don't want to have an air bubble. And it's going to be useful to bring along a funnel for this. And then if your funnel can't quite get you exactly where you want because you want to fully top off the cell because you want to have no air bubble if possible, I've also brought along a pipette with a pipette bowl. So first I will take this and I'll grab a beaker real quick, just in case these are fairly expensive cells. I don't want it to fall over and break. So I'll grab a beaker. And this beaker I'll use to place the cell in just so that if it happens to fall over, it won't fall the whole way over it will be held upright. Then I'll take my funnel, place that down inside the cell, and then start to pour. I'll actually lift it out here for a moment. Start to pour into this to fill up my polarimetry cell. And then as I begin to fill this up, I'm going to have to pull my funnel out because it's taking up some room and then fill some more. And finally, I'll get to the point where the funnel is mostly useless. I've only got a little bit of room left in the top of the cell, which you can't even see. It's mostly full, it's full just to here, but if I were to put the end piece on now, I would have quite a sizable air bubble. So I want to take my pipette and carefully top off the solution as much as possible 
so that there is no room remaining. Carefully take my window, place it on top and screw it down. All the way firm, not too tight, but firm. And then I can take this and if there's any moisture on the outside, if I spilled anything, I would take not really a paper towel of sorts, maybe a paper towel on the glass, but I don't want to use the paper towel on the windows because I might scratch the windows. So the best thing to use here is Kim wipes. So I'll grab those in a second. And then I can clean off both windows. So I've grabbed some Kim wipes here, can carefully clean the windows, wipe off the outside of the cell, clean the other window. And then we'll notice that if I hold it sideways here, I actually do have a small bubble, a small air bubble, which you may not be able to see well. It's gotten trapped in this side piece here, which is exactly what that is for. And now that will keep that air bubble out of the path length of the light when I put this into the, spec into the polarimeter. So now that that bubble, that small air bubble has been caught in the neck, we're all set to add this to the polarimeter. So I'm gonna open up the cell. Doesn't matter whether the neck is pointing downwards or upwards as long as the uh, bubble remains trapped. So we'll simply place that in the polarimeter cell, slide it down, close the cell again. And then now we are all set to look through the eyepiece here. Now, unlike most polarimeters that want you to um, place your sample in and then change the rotation using this bottom knob here to maximize the light through the solution so that, or to maximize the light that's coming through the eyepiece to get the, um, the small disc to be entirely light. This particular polarimeter has been set so that you calibrate it by uh, and take the measurements by adjusting the knob to make the um, disc be entirely dark. So we can read the measurement by finding first where the zero line on the left hand side lines up with lines or in between lines on the right hand side. So here it appears that the zero line is lying in between the six and the seven on the right hand side. So our ones digit would be a six. And then to find the decimal place, we look for which of the small lines on the left and on the right line up perfectly. So we look for the best match and choose then uh, that as the decimal place. So it looks as though the line at four, no, perhaps five on the left appears to match most perfectly with the line on the right down around here there seems to be a line around five that appears to align up perfectly or very close with the line on the right in fact perhaps it's the 4.5 that matches the per the most perfectly so 4.5 that would be the decimal place so 0.45 so our observed rotation would be 6.45 for this sample So initially, after placing the sample in the polarimeter, we see uh, when we look through the eyepiece, a lot of light coming through. And so we want to adjust the lower dial so that we get it as uniformly dark as possible. We won't be able to prevent all of the light from getting through, but we wanted to get it as uniformly dark as possible. So we'll increase the rotation. You can see decrease in the amount of light. Ooh, it appears we've gone past. So we need to work our way backwards. To the point where it seems to be most uniformly dark, which is about there. And then now we can take our measurement on the dial and see that the measurement is about 11.85 or so.